Um, so the strongest and most important aspects of the anatomy, or ligamentous anatomy is in the back. Uh, 
Uh, so you have your posterior SI ligaments, uh, which are very strong, and then your sacral tuberous ligaments uh, for to basically gate for, go from your sacrum to your ischial tuberosity, and they provide your vertical stability of your pelvis. Uh, in addition, we also have these uh, uh, lumbar ligaments, and they, they also have short uh, sacroiliac ligaments, but they're not as important as these two here. Anteriorly, uh, you can see you have your anterior sacroiliac ligaments. You also have your uh, inter uh, ligaments in between the SI joint, as well as your sacrospinous ligaments. Uh, these are less robust and, uh, and not as strong as the posterior ones, and they provide rotational stability. Uh, and then depending on, uh, you know, obviously the mechanism and the amount of energy transferred through the pelvis is whether or not you're going to disrupt, uh, you know, your pubic symphysis, your anterior, and then obviously your posterior uh, SI ligaments as well. Other ligaments to uh, kind of keep in mind are your iliolumbar uh, ligaments, which basically go from your L4 and L5 transverse processes to the posterior iliac crest, uh, as well as your lumbar sacral ligaments, which basically go from your L5 transverse processes to your sacral ala. So these are going to be uh, important because especially as you get your AP pelvis or your lumbar x-rays, if you see kind of transverse process emulsion fractures, these are kind of indicators that there's a more high energy uh, mechanism of injury uh, that occurred. So this is, a, I like to decide to show this slide because this kind of shows the vascular anatomy and how rich it is in both the arterial and the venous around the, around the pelvis. And so when you, when you fracture the pelvis, not only could you disrupt your pelvis, your, your, Ligamentous anatomy, the bony anatomy, you can have bleeding from your bony anatomy, but you can have a lot of bleeding from your vascular anatomy. Um, so, this is kind of like obviously looking into the pelvis, and there's major blood vessels that lie within the inner wall of the pelvis. Um, obviously, your uh, commonly like artery comes and divides and gives off your external iliac uh, artery and vein, which will, uh, runs along the pelvic brain and then goes underneath the inguinal ligament to become the femoral artery and vein. But then your internal iliac comes over the pelvic brim and then has an anterior and posterior course. Um, on the posterior branches, you can kind of see here, they give off like very important arteries and, and veins, particularly your iliolumbar, your superior gluteal, which comes right underneath the radar side of the notch, um, and your lateral sacral arteries. And all these can be disrupted, uh, arteries and veins, and all these can be disrupted, especially with fractures exiting through the radar side of the notch. Um, as you come more anteriorly, it divides up into your obturator artery and, uh, and vein, uh, and then obviously your umbilical ves vesicles, etc., but then your pudendum as well. So obviously, fractures, especially to the anterior portion of the pelvis, can disrupt these. And there's a, you know, sometimes there's a major connections between the internal and external iliac called the corona mortis. So even like young, older, you know, low energy fractures, which have, which are presenting very hemodynamically unstable, can have a rupture of that corona mortis. Uh, so it's important to kind of recognize. Obviously, in high energy um, pelvic fractures, there's concern for neurological injury. And you can see, especially with the lumbar sacral plexus, uh, the femoral nerve and the sciatic nerve around the pelvis, uh, that's also important to, to keep in mind. And then finally, obviously, visceral anatomy. Um, so either this can be blunt trauma caused by the actual uh, injury to the pelvis or actually the uh, the viscera being impaled by a bony spike. Obviously, the bladder and the urethra, uh, you know, the urethra being a little bit longer in males. Prostate, obviously, in males, the vagina in females, and then the rectum are all in close proximity and have to be considered uh, during your evaluation. So, again, looking through that evaluation, number one, it's a multidisciplinary trauma team approach. And I can't emphasize that enough because I think this is the most important thing to take away from trauma that is a team approach. Um, so obviously this team approach lends itself to ATLS and like I said in my open fracture um, talk, I think at the end of the day, you know, especially with a patient who comes in and the distracting injury might be the pelvis, it's important to go through your, through your ATLS protocol uh, uh, to uh, address the injuries in a systematic fashion. So obviously your primary survey, like I said, not to belabor the point, airway maintenance uh, with uh, cervical spine protection, breathing and ventilation, and then you know obviously with the pelvis, we're, we're concerned about the circulation of hemorrhage control. But again, like I said, well, the neurological injury, find, trying to find the neurological status, and then exposing the patient appropriately, but keeping the environmental control, especially warming the patient to prevent hypothermia, to prevent hypothermia um, that will help with your uh, coagulopathy. So, you know, the kind of the first thing, obviously, you can do is inspect the patient. 
Um, and especially with unstable pelvic fractures in both the vertical and horizontal plane, you can have limb shortening and limb rotation, which can be very obvious. Uh, and that can be obviously masked by obviously uh, lower extremity injuries as well. It's really important to like understand and like uh, recognize these degloving injuries or the so-called moral level lay lesions. So basically there are closed internal degloving, which usually occurs over the greater trochanter. So you can see this, you know, like this is obviously a picture in the OR where there is an incision and basically the entire fascia disrupts from the subcutaneous tissue, but it's all in a closed manner. Uh, and this ecchymosis and you know bruising and swelling, even though swelling may be obvious, this ecchymosis may not be occur right away. But it's important to kind of recognize this because those have significant implications with the fact that these can get uh, have a high incidence of infection if they're not um, debrided uh, or uh, closed over uh, drains with IR, etc. The other important thing to do is to recognize uh, the importance of open fractures. So open pelvic fractures are not as obvious as open fractures to your tibia, open fractures to your forearm, because the pelvis is not exactly going to be sticking out. So it's really important to, like, number one, uh, understand that there are, these open wounds can be obvious in the perineum, rectum, and the colon, and these need to be inspected, and if they, there's any incidence of this, number one, obviously giving the appropriate antibiotics, but getting an a, a early diverting colostomy by your general surgeon colleagues, and again, in females especially, vaginal injuries, these are often missed, um, and it's, it's important to recognize these and repair these because often these will uh, have sequelae in, in terms of abscesses. And then, you know, for test taking things, you know, like you have scrotal thigh hematoda, hematomas that, are, that occur as well as you can see in these pictures. So, uh, obviously assessing the pelvis during the primary survey also includes inspection, so we talked about sort of the, uh, the urethra being damaged, so anything blood in the meatus, hematuria, uh, or hyoretic prostate on your rectal exam, you know, it's all indicative of a urological injury, which can be as high as 15% um, in high energy pelvic injuries. So, you know, the, the classic thing is you're diagnosing it by a, a, a retrograde urethrogram. Urethral injuries are, are more common. Males are obviously are more common than females just because of the length of the urethra. Uh, you know, common test question that we have in ortho is like the posterior urethral tear is the kind of the most common. Uh, they're highest mostly with APC3 injuries, and we'll kind of go more into the classification after I go through all the evaluation. Bladder injuries are a little bit less common, and, uh, but uh, more common with the lateral compression type injuries. Uh, and then remember, you know, your intraperitoneal versus your extraperitoneal versus your combined. So again, obviously your extraperitoneal are more common. They're kind of the 80% range. Um, these are either pelvic fractures or penetrating trauma. And if you do your, cystos uh, your cystoscopy, you'll have a variable path of like the extravasated contract, contrast material. And your, your treatment is very different. It's usually an indwelling catheter. Versus your intraperitoneal, obviously, you know, by the name itself, uh, you're going intraperitoneal, so your contrast material is going to be within your bowel loops, your mesenteric folds, pericolic gutters, etc. Uh, and this needs surgical repair. Uh, and obviously, the, um, the combined is a combination of both. From an orthopedic point of view, if you do have a, if you do have a bladder injury, especially the intraperitoneal that needs surgical repair, ideally you want those either repaired before we repair the pelvis or at the same time to try to minimize the, the risk of infection. Uh, and a lot of times these patients get superpubic catheters and it's really important to try to avoid uh, putting a superpubic catheter, especially anteriorly because that's a lot where the definitive pelvic fixation is going to go. Um, so ideally we try to get you know, either the urologist or the trauma surgeons to try to tunnel it either to the right or left side, uh, depending if that's possible. So this is kind of a classic uh, paper uh, that was kind of written by one of my mentors in Calgary. Uh, and you know, like examining the pelvis for stability. And everyone says, you know, you kind of have to like examine the pelvis, examine the pelvis once. This is kind of a classic maneuver where you're trying to feel over the ASIS bi bilaterally and you're pushing kind of outwards to feel whether you're, you're uh, rotationally un unstable. And if you're vertically unstable, you can have, a, you can have that same person trying to feel the pelvis and another person moving the leg up and down. Um, and I'm not a huge proponent of this. Uh, and part of this is because, you know, especially, and this is probably the best one, best study, where they looked at 1,500 patients. They looked at 115 patients with pelvic fractures, including 34 with really unstable fracture patterns. 
and they looked whether or not they could actually detect um, instability on a physical exam, uh, and especially with blunt trauma. And you can see here, you know, with a quote unquote unstable exam or pelvic deformity, the amount of people over that can actually detect this is quite low. So, and that's both kind of the sensitivity and the specificity. Um, so, and obviously, you know, like uh, somebody who's trained in trauma has been inspected a thousand pelvises versus some, you know, the first year intern who de does it completely variable. So, I think personally, you get much more better evaluation from an AP pelvis. So, remember, part of your ATLS survey is getting these simple x rays. So, one shooting a chest x ray, one shooting an AP pelvis, the C spine, you know, sort of coming in and out of favor, especially with the advent of CT, especially level one trauma centers. But the chest x-ray and the AP pelvis, regardless whether you have CT available, I think is really important to shoot right away because both those imaging modalities can uh, give you a lot of information right away. And for me personally, I think the AP pelvis is a very easy and quick tool that will help you, number one, guide risk assessment and quickly identify your high-risk pelvic disruptions much more better than a physical exam would uh, and can guide your initial treatment. So, Pelvic stability, what does it actually mean? So, in orthopedics, we kind of define stability as the ability of a bone, or in this case, the pelvic ring, to withstand physiologic forces without abnormal deformation. So, what does that mean? So, like in a pelvis, if you think about it, you know, somebody rupturing their ACL, you know, weekend warrior, it's only 500 or 1,000 newtons. And I'll see one pelvic fracture, which is the little old lady falling on her side and getting the cubic rami fractures at the back and maybe having an impaction of the sacrum at the back. That's six to nine times as much as that, you know, weekend warrior tearing his ACL. And then, so if you take that and translate to the high energy pelvic fractures, obviously high energy pelvic fractures are going to be rarely isolated. So they have to be a marker for severe injury. So you can see here, you know, CNS injuries, GI injuries, up to 30%. More than half these patients have thoracic injuries. Like almost 80% of them have some other type of musculoskeletal injury. Like we talked about before, your general injuries can be up to 20%. And then like we said before, lumbosacral plexus is anywhere between, sorry, it's supposed to be 0.8 to, to 5%. So how we define pelvic stability is obviously rated graphically, biomechanically, which are kind of interrelated, and then hemodynamically. So with radiography, as I talked about with an AP pelvis, right? So these are obviously two different patients. And that one AP pelvis can give you a remarkable amount of information about how unstable this pelvis is. So obviously on this side, it's a little more subtle. You've got inferior and superior pubic rami fractures on both sides, probably more prominent on the left. This left uh, SI joint may be more, or sorry, the left sacrum may be more impacted. But it's not grossly unstable as to this one on the, on the right side here where your pubic symphysis is grossly um, widened and you have obvious gross disruption of your SI joint on the left, uh, uh, meaning that this whole left hemi pelvis may be unstable and you can't even tell what's on the right. So things that obviously are radiographic signs of instability. So if you have SI displacement of 5 millimeters greater than in any plane, um, that's a pretty significant sign of instability. Obviously, if you have a posterior fracture gap rather than impaction, so if you look at this, right, so this is maybe impacted, it's hard to see, you can probably see that on CT scan, but here there's an obvious gap. Um, that's a good radiographic sign of instability. And then what I talked about before, these avulsion fractures. So the transverse process fractures of L4, L5, um, which are indicative of your iliolumbar or your lateral lumbar sacral ligaments. And then if you have these uh, avulsion fractures of either your ischial spine, which is, you know, onto your hamstrings, but also your sacral spinous ligament and then your lateral border of your sacrum. If you see these, these are actually markers of, uh, uh, of gross instability. So this is kind of more of a completion uh, than it is in the emergent management of pelvic fractures. Obviously, AP pelvis is the most important. After you get the uh, patient stabilized, you can get these views. But these got to give you a little bit more information. So you're going to view, obviously, with the supine pa patient, the, um, the uh, beam is directed from cephalad to caudad, and it can tell you your AP translation. So you're basically you're looking at the inlet or the, uh, 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 of the pelvis, and you can see whether it's going to be displaced posteriorly or anteriorly. You're going to be able to see the sacral ala. You're going to see the, uh, to see the SI joints kind of end on here. Uh, and then you can see fractures that exit into the uh, iliac wing or the pelvic ring. Uh, 
The output view is kind of the opposite, so the beam is, uh, is uh, directed to caudad to cephalad, and that's going to give you kind of vertical translation. So you can see here from the model on the x-ray, either it's going to be superior or inferior translation, and you're also going to be able to see flexion extension um, abnormalities with regards to the right or left uh, uh, hemi pelvis. Here you can kind of see the arbitrator foramens on, on point, so you can see fractures exiting into those, and then you can kind of see the sapo foramen more, so you can see uh, fractures either exiting into the sapo foramen, uh, and then you can correlate that with your neurological exam. And again, the inland and outland views, again, are not emergent. These are kind of more after the patient stabilized. CT scan, I think, is like very important. Uh, obviously, CT scan, a lot of trauma patients were hemodynamically stable enough to go to CT scan, get a CT abdo pelvis. Um, you know, I kind of try to see if they can get, you know, more, a little bit uh, finer cuts rather than the five millimeters because that gives you a little bit more information bony about the bony anatomy. But basically, it delineates your posterior injury that you may not see on x-ray. The amount of displacement, obviously, rotation, the amount of comminution, and then obviously assessing the neural foramina and how much extension uh, of those fractures go into that. So basically, like there, there's lots of several classification systems of pelvic uh, fractures, that, uh, and the things that I try to emphasize to my ortho residents is number one, you want to learn the classification systems that are going to help you prognosticate or diagnose or diagnose uh, uh, patients. So the this. The young inverse classification is probably the best classification that you should know because it most co closely correlates with both your resuscitation needs and the patterns of associated injuries. So there's basically like four main um, categories. So I kind of alluded to some of them before. So lateral compression, anterior posterior compression, vertical shear, and then the fourth is that obviously a combined mechanism. So lateral compression, I mean, these are pretty like self-explanatory. So lateral compression means that, the, that there's a lateral impact of the pelvis and the pelvis starts rotating uh, toward the midline uh, and as the energy increases, the higher the mechanism of energy that uh, goes through the pelvis and the, high, and the more unstable it becomes. So obviously with an LC1, you just may have, like, you know, like I said, your inferior pubic ring by fractures and maybe an impaction fracture of that sacral ala, but then as you get more energy, now your sacral tuberous, sacral spinous ligaments may become involved, your anterior SI joint may become involved, and then you get these windswept pelvises, which are very unstable in both rotationally and vertical planes in the LC3. Anterior posterior compression, this is kind of like what most people worry about uh, in terms of like hemodynamic instability, we'll go more into that. <laughs> So this is obviously an anterior impact of the pelvis which disrupts the front, your pubic symphysis. And obviously as more energy goes through, not only are you disrupting the pubic symphysis, but now you're disrupting the sacred tuberous ligaments, and then your anterior SI, then your posterior SI, which gets you rotationally unstable, and then obviously if your posterior SI ligaments are gone, then you become vertically unstable. With a vertical shear type fracture, again, the, uh, the uh, plane of uh, um, injuries going from <coughs> cephalad to caudad or vice versa, and your hemi pelvis is unstable in the vertical plane. And these obviously are, uh, are associated with severe either local vascular or neurological injuries. And then like I said before, combined injury, because not every pelvis fracture is going to fit nicely into this little box, is going to be a combined injury of both these two. Usually those are much, much more high energy uh, and have a higher degree of mortality, etc. So why is this important? Uh, why is this important? Because like I said before, this actually gives you prognosis. So as, as you can imagine, you know, an APC, a vertical shear, where you're having a marked amount of um, uh, forces that either shear uh, your vascular structures, especially venous, um, your, transfusion, your transfusion requirements are going to be significantly higher. So the APC, which most people kind of pay more attention to, has the highest transfusion requirements and has the highest mortality. And these are then combined pelvic and visceral anatomy, uh, injuries. The vertical shear, again, lots of transfusion requirements. And counterintuitive, your mortality isn't as high, but I think these are because they're more uncommon uh, and, and not necessarily uh, seen as much. Combined mechanisms, which are going to be the high energy mechanisms that don't fit into any type. Again, higher transfusion requirements, high mortality, and again, it's 
translated to the fact that they have higher energy. And then obviously, as predicted, you know, your lateral compression are going to have the lowest transfusion requirements, and their mortality isn't really necessarily going to be because of the pelvis or hemorrhage, it's more closed head injuries, which kind of fits in, in keeping with uh, this mechanism. So, you know, again, I kind of show this ATLS kind of uh, hemorrhage um, classification system, not that you don't know it, but just uh, evaluating the, in the sense that, number one, the evaluation and the management of hypovolemic shock is mandatory as airway and breathing are being stabilized. So, the reason for that is because hypotension, is not, as we talked about the beginning, is it increases mortality right at the beginning, but also increases your, your chance of multi-organ failure, if a patient ever goes to the ICU, ARDS, etc. And so it's really important to have like a rapid and systematic approach to finding the source of hypotension uh, and then treating it. So like I said before, you know, this all goes along and occurs simultaneously as you're evaluating the patient. So as the patient gets wheeled in, two larger but uh, large bore IVs, go to the antecubital fossa, you're running crystal lord right away. And the biggest thing is to identify the sites of hemorrhage. So even if you get that AP pelvis, that AP pelvis shows a, shows a big open book front pelvis or vertically unstable pelvis fracture, it's really important to identify shock and instability. And you know, because your hemoglobin, hematocrit, as you know, doesn't correspond to like massive blood loss right away. And like we said, patients presenting in shock have increased mortality. It's really important to start, if, if you know that this is going to be a problem, to start your massive transfusion protocol and it's a one to one to one ratio of blood products. Uh, as recently uh, um, published in JAMA. And then, like we said before, keeping the patients warm. So hypothermia increases coagulopathy. Coagulopathy increases increased hemorrhage. And a quarter multiple injury patients coming with coagulopathy, uh, despite what uh, season it is. And then again, this is what I kind of want to reiterate. Um, so lots of studies, you know, and, and it's really important to, to recognize unstable pelvis fractures from a radiographic point of view. But massive bleeding from a pelvic fracture alone is very uncommon. And so there's multiple studies, and this study was really good, and they looked at blunt pelvic trauma, and you know, they had almost 8% mortality. 40% of these died because of hemorrhage, but the vast majority of these died from hemorrhages outside of the pelvis. So it's really important to identify all the sites of hemorrhage. So obviously the external wounds are going to be pretty obvious, but then again, internally, right? So the chest x-ray is going to be really important. See if you've got that massive uh, uh, hemoneumo, abdomen, uh, so a fast exam can be uh, done right uh, at the bedside or a CT scan. Retroperitoneal is going to be a bit harder to diagnose, and that can be done on a CT scan. And then, like I said before, long bones, right? Like a femur, tibia, like you can lose one to two liters uh, pretty uh, fast in those, so it's important to do a physical exam, get x rays if you can, and splint those to try and obtain hemorrhage control. But, you know, obviously you have to keep the pelvic fracture uh, in mind. So, if there's initial attempts to control bleeding from all other sources are, are failed to stabilize the patient, especially, and then especially if you have like transient responders or non-responders to resuscitation, it's important to take into account the pelvis fracture. And obviously, when we talked about this, this, uh, this vascular anatomy, the vast majority is going to be venous bleeding. But, uh, you do have arterial bleeding. And like we talked about before, you know, the superior glutal artery comes right underneath that greater static notch. Your internal pedonal uh, is more with the LC anterior ring injuries, lateral sacral, your aberrant obturator artery, like I said, your corona mortis before. So all these you have to kind of take into account, especially when you like to try to identify the other sources of hemorrhage. Uh, and the patient's either, like, like I said, either transit responding or non-responding. So how do we control hemorrhage in the pelvic fracture patient? So number one is pelvic containment, and those are basically modalities that close the ring. So obviously it makes sense for closing the ring in, in patients that have like an open fracture, like an open, sorry, an open book pelvis fracture, or something that's going to be really vertically unstable. Um, so these non they can be either non-invasive, so non-invasive pelvic stabilization, so a pelvic sheet or pelvic binder, which I'll go more to, or it could be invasive such as external fixation. Uh, hemorrhage control can also be in the form of angiography, kind of talk about that, and then finally pelvic packing. So let me talk about pelvic containment before. So <coughs> the classic kind of teaching is, is that you know, unstable pelvis, especially with an APC, APC3, where your pelvis is wide open, you're trying to close the volume, and trying to close the volume is 
restricting the amount of volume that can uh, blood that can uh, pool in the pelvis, uh, and you're going to tap and add that. So there's been some kind of recent studies that have seen that, yes, that is true. Uh, and I won't kind of bore you into details of this, but even though that the tamp and add effect is there, uh, when they looked at how much patients kind of bled and how much stability they got from pelvic containment, the majority of it wasn't actually in the pelvic reduction or the, the reduction of pelvic volume. It was more of the stabilization of the actual bony injury. And so pelvic containment, yes, it closes the ring and has some effect on pelvic volume. But what I want to kind of give across to you that has a larger effect on actually stabilizing the clots from bony surfaces and the vascular structures. So this is probably like if there's one thing that you can take away from this talk is circumferential sheeting. Uh, because wherever you are, you can absolutely wrap a pelvis in a, something that's readily available uh, and doesn't take um, uh, rocket science to put on, doesn't need a special, special pelvic binder. So, and, and this is kind of what I kind of reiterate to my, to my ortho residents as well. So I personally think you need kind of three people to properly sheet a pelvis. So ideally, I think your trauma bay, and I think they, they're starting to do a good job of this at, over at County, is that your trauma bay with your, with your, uh, with your trauma table should have a, uh, an open sheet and the sheet should be open, as you can see, pretty wide here already. So when the patient gets transferred, there's no fussing around, the patient's already in spinal precautions, the sheet's already down there. So ideally, you have two wrappers. So you can see here, the first wrapper takes the sheet and puts it over from right to left or vice versa, and then he holds that. And then the second wrapper brings the other sheet up and over, and then they both simultaneously pull together, so you're actually containing or, or, or closing that pelvic volume. And then you have a third person who's the quote unquote clamper who goes in and then puts clamps and ideally, and this is probably the ideal situation and I try to tell my residents and stuff this, is that you try to put four clamps and you try to put them out of the way of the abdomen or extremities, especially where you know, the trauma surgeon may need to access the abdomen or you need to access vascular uh, uh, or get vascular access. So these are kind of examples, and so the Harborview group, group kind of um, showed this. So this is an example of a, I think it was a 21-year-old female. She had a, a, a motorcycle injury. You can see she has a wide open book pelvis. She dislocated her hip as well. They reduced her hip. And you can see the, the clamps here. Uh, and they kind of adjusted their protocol as it went on. But you can see how this massive, unstable pelvis with sheeting now almost looks anatomic. Again, another patient. Uh, this is a male patient, uh, unstable pelvis fracture on both sides, massive kidney synthesis widening, uh, and then again, application of uh, a binder slash sheet, and you can see how well that pelvis stabilizes in terms of both pelvic volume and actually getting a reduction. What I think, why I think circumferential sheeting is really important and almost better than pelvic binding is, is because you can adjust the sheet, you can cut around the sheet without actually having to take it off. Um, for either your general surgeons to get access to the abdomen or if you need to get access for IR or angio. Um, so, you know, your access portals can be actually cut into the sheet and if you, especially if you have, like I said before, your, your clamps at the, at the four ends, you know your, your interventional radiologist, your general surgeon can cut around this and the actual sheet itself is not going to be disrupted. Um, obviously, there's lots of commercially uh, available pelvic binders. Uh, and these were done to uh, ensure that, uh, uh, or to make it easier. Again, I think these are great if you have them, but if you don't have them, then you have to rely on public uh, sheeting. What's the most important, and I kind of glance over here, is that when you're pelvic sheeting or pulling your pelvic binder, this isn't up by your abdomen, it isn't down here, it's centered over your greater trochanters. So you can see here in this, greater trochanters are here. Um, the, uh, these Publicly, uh, sorry, these uh, commercially available binders are a little bit lower profile, so they don't go up as high, so they try to get more access to the abdomen, etc. The key thing is to center over the greater trochanter, not the abdomen. There's so many times where, you know, I'll go down and assess, and they're open book, and the, and the binder or the sheet is way up here, or the, or the sheet is rolled up and tried to tie it at the front, and I think that um, that's the wrong thing to do. So again, examples of pelvic binding, 
can see kind of the binder strap or the, the radial opaque option of the binder. Another open book pelvis, almost anatomical reduction or, or great uh, uh, stabilization of these temporary. Um, so non-invasive pelvic stabilization, and this was kind of developed especially in, um, out in the battlefield situation, situation. We talked about before is that especially if your whole hemi pelvis is, is unstable, you can have external rotation of the lower extremity, and especially in really big male patients. So in this patient, even putting a pelvic binder on in a really big uh, in a really big patient, their right or their affected lower extremity will still want to externally rotate. So I tell sometimes, especially if you don't have a lower extremity fracture or anything, just tape your knees or tape your feet together, or put another binder or put another sheet around the knees or, or the uh, or the feet, and that can actually improve help your pelvic reduction, actually improve your pelvic sheathing or your pelvic binder. Uh, and this kind of multiple binder technique, as you can see here, can alleviate some of the concerns about soft tissue problems, uh, especially when you're in the ICU, etc. Uh, can you allow for like one daily check over the skin of the, or the skin of the greater trochanter uh, while maintaining a general reduction and not having to take it off and, and disrupt all the stabilization of the clots that you've done. So there, there are some obviously some caveats, and at the end of the day, I always tell uh, tell when I give this kind of talk, you know, if you're if you're not sure, just put the pelvic binder on. The the chances of you actually harming a patient are low. Um, there are some caveats, obviously lateral compression injuries. Um, they can get worse by putting a, a binder on. Um, so you can see here, this is a, like a, a lateral LC3, a very unstable fracture pattern where the fracture goes all the way posteriorly. You can see here, this is before and after. So this is a CT scan with the patient in a binder. You can see how the whole hemipelvis and the lateral compression can actually get worse. Um, which is why I said it's important if you recognize at the very start that you're that your AP pelvis doesn't show a open book or a vertical shear type, you know, a pelvic binder may not help. Again, some of the other caveats are, you know, skeletal traction is also very important to take into account. That first patient I saw, I showed you had a dislocated hip. Um, so, you know, that greater trochanter may not be obviously as obvious. So putting, you know, distal femoral traction or some type of or proximal tibial traction to reduce either a dislocated extremity, as in this case, or a massive vertical shear can actually help bring down the pelvis before you actually shear the patient or, or bind the patient. Again, like I said, it reduces displacement, adds stability, improve, can improve your hemodynamics, it overcomes the deforming forces, uh, but it's important obviously to try and get, obtain at least some imaging or ensure that there's no massive soft tissue uh, uh, injury uh, to the place that you're actually uh, placing your distal trauma traction. Uh, it's also important to, to to recognize that you know, pelvic sheathing, pelvic binding are temporizing measures. So this is not going to be the definitive surgery for this, but basically it's utilized until more definitive uh, fixation can be done. And obviously prolonged use of sheets or binders can, use, uh, can lead to soft tissue problems. Um, despite you know, the fact that I, I try to use um, pelvic sheathing, uh, access for a secondary survey or like various procedures can still be hindered. Uh, and like I said before, you know, it's, Decreasing your clot, it's, it's increasing your stability of your fracture, but it's not going to actually control any arterial hemorrhage. So the biggest debate, you know, like that I had, especially when I first came here, was like, oh, whether you have to X-fix this pelvis or not. Um, so you know, and I'll kind of go through the indications for for X-fixing the pelvis. So obviously, it's in resuscitative mode for emergent surgery with open wounds or intra-abdominal bleeding. So if you know general surgery or trauma surgery is taking that patient to the OR. Um, and they're going to take off the sheet, or they, they find that the sheet's more cumbersome, I think it's really important to put an X-fix there so you can get the, the, um, the benefits of sheeting at least temporarily. So again, like I said, it's limiting pelvic displacement, so when, especially when you're transferring the patient, it's a reduction of that pelvic volume that we talked about, but more importantly, probably opposition of that displaced fracture and helping control the bleeding from the raw bony surfaces as well as stabilizing all your clots. There's some studies, this, this was out of hard review, that it actually decreases pain in the polytraumatized patients, although that's questionable because it's hard to actually prove. You can actually use it as your, as your definitive management, especially in a patient who has other issues that you can't necessarily go open and plate, such as uh, your uh, bladder injury, etc. Or it can be used in as, as an adjunct to your definitive uh, fixation. So, you know, this is, again, a little bit more technical, but 
you know, the location of, of your of your X fix. So, uh, and I preached this to my residents because we had a we had a patient actually that came in yesterday at County like this. The ideal spot where you want to put it is super ass tabular or your AIS. And I think that's the most important and like actually relevant. If you're actually putting the ASS, that's augmentative, and I don't think actually helps. And then I'll talk about the C clamp, although the C clamp uh, is not necessarily it's not necessarily that common and it has to be done under um, with experienced hand. So you know the, the classic thing is the ASS or so putting it into the iliac crest or just above the ASS, or the AIS or super ass tabular region. So obviously with open book pelvis injuries, uh, their external rotation injuries, especially with the posterior uh, ligaments intact, you know both your ASS and your AIS uh, exercises will work, but your AIS actually will work better, and I'll show you that uh, as we go on. Lateral compression injuries, you know, no design really works well because they're kind of serving the same purpose as in trying to control rotation. But if you think about it, trying to control the rotation of a hemi pelvis just through a thin cortex of your uh, of your iliac crest is very is very difficult. Versus an AAS is, is actually more uh, beneficial. So there's been some uh, biomechanical studies, and, and this one was actually very well done, and they looked at AAS sorry like iliac crest versus supraostabular pins. They found that AAS pins have a better vector, they have increased stability. If you're going to definitively treat them, they actually allow the patient to sit, so they can sit in a wheelchair with it, with it not uh, interfering with either an abdomen or upper extremity uh, physical therapy, etc. So the ASS, like I talked about, it goes within the uh, the outer table. Uh, you have the identification of the starting point is very easy. You make a decision right over the iliac crest, and most patients you can feel that. You don't have to necessarily rely on fluoroscopy, especially in an emergent situation, but. There's pretty severe and I think disadvantages. One is that the thinner distal aspect increases the risk of perforation. It may interfere actually with your abdominal procedures, which may be life saving. Uh, and you actually need more than one fixation for increased stability, especially if those if those pins aren't perfect. Um, so this is like you know like technical details, but like ideally you want your ASAS pins right in between the inner and outer table. So like that trajectory. And so to get that trajectory, it's actually like pretty difficult. And like, this is like, you know, a shot from Harborview that they're doing this all under fluoroscopic control to get a perfect shot now. And obviously confirm pin placement. You can see how thin on the CT that it gets, especially as you get more posterior. And so as a result, if you're putting this on an emergent situation, you can see that, great, you know, the, the top of the early air crest is like this, but it thins out. You can see on both sides that the amount that actually goes in is not is probably not ideal. And as such, you know, I think it's more important and, and more advantageous if you're actually going to take this patient to the OR to do a supraz tabular pin. So number one, it has superior rotational resistance to the iliac crest pins that we talked about. Your bony fixation is actually in between that region right above your ass tab in a bony column all the way to your PSAS, and the positioning actually provides better control. The disadvantage, obviously, is that you need, ideally, fluoro in the OR, uh, and, and this is what I mean by fluoro in the R is that your starting point you get here, and then your trajectory is right above the greater side of the notch. You can see right above the acetabulum, and it's going in this thick piece of bone uh, between the inner and outer tables, but between your AIS, which is here, and your PSIS, which is there. Uh, the C clamp, again, like, uh, again, not many institutions have this. Like when I first came here, I asked about this, and the only place in New York that has this is actually Jamaica. Um, but basically it was developed to overcome the inadequacies of external fixation, especially with the posterior displacement. So basically it's placed in similar location as, as an iliosacral screw, but the biggest issue is that it has to be placed with experienced hands. So you can see here that like this open bone pelvis slash vertical shear combined mechanism, you can see the, the anterior disruption here, but you can see how wide this SI joint is. And with the application of your C clamp, you can see how number one, it gets your posterior um, uh, pelvis reduced significantly, which aids in, in reduction of your anterior um, a part of your pelvis. However, um, sorry, in addition to that, you know the C clamp has a pretty large curvature of radius, so it allows abdominal access. You can combine it with pelvic packing, um, so it has a, a nice advantages, but it's also pretty can be pretty dangerous, right? So
This again is another vertically unstable pelvis fracture, but rather than through the SI joint, it's through the sacrum. And you can see here it's through almost the sacral foramen. And you can see the CT scan post C clamp placement that if you're placing it, and you, especially with these type of fractures, you can actually over compress and cause significant damage, especially in a patient who may be neurologically intact before. So contraindications, I think, to X-fix are number one, stable pelvic fracture patterns. So the lateral compression type injuries, especially the lower, uh, um, the lower energy type ones. Uh, a floating iliac wing fracture. So then, then this again, like so, I, I try to show this through the 3D CT scan. So a fracture that actually goes through the iliac wing and doesn't actually disrupt the entire pelvis can be misleading because number one, if you do a an exam and you're like feeling that whole anterior wing, you can actually um, misread that for being uh, unstable. And then obviously acetabular fracture. So obviously the acetabulars are part of the pelvis, but acetabulars so the fractures of the hip socket are not going to be are, are not going to be stabilized very well by it, by it. Uh, so moving on to angiography. So I think angiography, especially um, going in into the like early 2000s now, especially now, I think it's becoming more readily used. Uh, and, and basically, if you have a patient with continued unexplained blood loss despite your aggressive fluid and blood resuscitation, and despite the fact that you have pelvic control, whatever form that is, uh, or you have like evidence of contrast extravasation on CT scan, the angiography. These are the best indications for angiography. So, you know, like, because it's a kind of a more of an evolving thing, you know, the overall prevalence of pelvic fractures are actually required is right now in the current literature is less than 10%. And obviously we talked about before, APC injuries, vertical shear, or complex injuries have more higher uh, prevalence than lateral compression injuries. And then again, fractures going to specific arteries, especially into the greater sciatic arch, or sorry, greater sciatic notch. Um, uh, those are going to be a higher incidence. But all the studies now that have early angiography and subsequent embolization have demonstrated an improved patient outcome. So initially when they did it, they were non-selective. So they would just go in and coil the entire like internal iliac artery or external iliac artery. And obviously that is very good because it provides great hemorrhage control. But it also has a lot of, lot of morbidity that, uh, especially if you're going to do surgery, etc. Especially if you have a morale lay lesion. So now, more and more, especially with more well-trained IR people, they're going to more selective techniques. Again, it's good for arterial control, but not in venous or bony bleeding. And even if you go to angiography, the really important thing to know is that you can get recurrent pelvic bleeding despite the fact that you went to angiography. And the studies now show it can be as high as up to almost a quarter of patients, which emphasizes the fact that even if you go to angiography, the patient stabilizes, it's really diligent, you really have to be diligent about monitoring them and keeping up with them in the ICU. Again, this is going to be institution dependent, dependent on whether you have the expertise of an IR interventional radiologist. It does take time, like most interventional radiologists don't, aren't in-house, and so they actually have to come in, and then, you know, the, there's always an issue of contrast out of it. So obviously the final kind of thing looking at uh, hemorrhage control is pelvic packing. So this was developed to basically achieve direct hemostasis and to control venous bleeding resulting from the pelvis fracture. And this was mostly popular in Europe where they've been advocating pelvic packing for more than 10 years. So they'd do an X-lap uh, and then they would go open up retroperitoneally and pack the pelvis. And these are, were, and they've had good outcomes, especially with patients in extremis. So the North American equivalent of this, and which has kind of been developed now, and, and you know, Dr. Buterakis, I think, you know, he trained at shock and he's a big proponent of this, is retroperitoneal packing. So basically it's modified where you're not opening up the perineum uh, and you're kind of just going inside the pelvis or retroperineal. Basically you're packing, you can see basically you're packing sponges all into the, into the quadrants of the pelvis um, and basically it's helping tamp and add things. And there's been studies that, number one, it can reduce unnecessary angiography. Uh, there's obviously like coiling an artery, especially if it's supplying bone and muscle, is not necessarily a good thing, but can do it, especially if a patient's life is on the line. Again, caveats to this, it doesn't help with acetabular fractures, which are often misdiagnosed. Uh, and then the incision, which is usually a vertical, may compromise pelvis or acetabular fixation. Uh, but again, life, life over limb. So, you know, the role of angiography in pelvic uh, packing, especially nowadays, is, is kind of being more well-defined. 
But I think you should either consider angiography with selective angio, uh, angiography embolization, or pelvic packing, or both. Number one, when you've ruled out other sources of bleeding, and you have persistent hemodynamic instability after you've controlled the pelvis, either with a binder or with an x -mas. And then remember that the pelvic packing mostly does venous, and the angiography is, uh, is, uh, is arterial. So they shouldn't be you know, necessarily dogmatic and you have to do one or the other. I think you do them either one or the other or combined depending on what your <coughs> clinical situation is. And then obviously the selection of whether what you do is number one, what your trauma surgeon kind of believes in. If you have an IR, um, uh, IR uh, radiologist available, and obviously the patient's location. If the patient's already in the OR, it's very easy if they've got an x lap to extend that down, consider pelvic packing. If they remain hemodynamically unstable despite pelvic packing, despite putting an X-fix, then it's, I think it's important to go then to, um, to angio afterwards. Or if you have a capability, which some level one trauma centers do have an on-table angio. So I think the most important of all this, like to, to like kind of wrap this up, is trying to develop a protocol for management. Um, so this group uh, out in Denver was the kind of the first group to publish way back in 2001 of their evolution of this multidisciplinary clinical pathway to the management of unstable pelvic fractures. So basically, they had five elements. Number one, their trauma surgeon was immediately available, uh, but this also included the orthopedic surgeon service, which included orthopedic attending. They had early simultaneous blood and coagulation products. They had prompt diagnosis of treatment of life-threatening injury. They had stabilization of the pelvic girdle. And initially, this was X-fix, but then over time, it became pelvic sheeting, uh, and then timely pelvic angiography uh, and embolization. So the changes with these elements, they found that number one, the patients that they saw were actually more severely injured. Um, so their ISS score had actually increased. Uh, number two is that, you know, and now you guys know, is that the DPL is kind of phased out and, and more fast ultrasound is used. And number three is this non-invasive pelvic stabilization replaced your traditional thinking that the X-fix had to get put on. So this is kind of, I don't know if you can kind of see this, but basically it's a slide showing what, what, their, what, their, um, what their treatment algorithm was. And if their, you know, if their, if their FAST was positive, they're going for laparotomy. If the laparotomy was stable, then they would go down, uh, you know, at the root of, oh, do we have to fix this now, or is he okay with the pelvis? If it wasn't stable, they went to angiography. And then if the, uh, the pelvic was contained, then they go down this route here to go down the SICU. If, they, if it was negative and they were stable, they got a workup. If they weren't stable, they went to angiography. But basically they found, and this is the most important and glaring thing, and then now that most level one institutions have instituted, is that number one, their mortality was cut in half, from 31 to 15%. Their uh, exsanguination death decreased ninefold. Uh, patients who died from, uh, or sorry, who had multi-organ failure decreased significantly, and their death within the first 24 hours decreased significantly. So basically, their basic, biggest thing that they found with this multidisciplinary approach was number one, they had improved patient survival by reducing early deaths uh, and reducing deaths from, uh, from multiple organ failure. So, you know, in addition to this, so you, you'll see in the literature there, there have been a lot of uh, pub published studies. This was actually published last month in JOT. Uh, out of a group in Dallas. Again, same thing. They looked at uh, 1,600, over 1,600, almost 1,700 patients with pelvic fractures. They tried to compare this to a control group that had no pelvic fractures, and they divided it in three time periods. You can see here the three time periods, A, B, and C. And they instituted this uh, protocol over this time period. Again, it's very similar to the last study. Number one, mortality rates decreased, even though their ISS scores in patients increased over time. So obviously B was better than A, C was better than B, and C was obviously better than A. And in addition to that, not only did their mortality increase, or sorry, decrease as a whole, but specifically mortality from very unstable pelvic fractures decreased to the point where now, in 2015, they have no difference in mortality between an unstable and a stable pattern um, compared to the early 2000s. And again, yeah. Sorry, I have to we're, we're actually out of time. We're, sure. We're over conference time, so but I do want to give you a chance to give some uh, final points sure. and uh, some questions. Sure. So, 
Uh, take home points, basically, number one, pelvic injuries are highly associated with other injuries, and it's important to, uh, to keep looking at that. Uh, again, like I said, like stress, it's a multidisciplinary approach, and follow ATL's protocol. Um, you know, evaluation of the pelvic stability is, is crucial, so you have to understand, number one, the fracture pattern and mechanism of injury. Uh, number, number two, your AP pelvis gives you probably the most information, and then combine that knowledge as to uh, finding out what the next step is. And then, um, obviously, unstable fracture patterns, especially open bulk or vertically unstable, can be effectively dealt with by simple means, especially um, uh, especially pelvic cheating. And then, I think the most important thing is like trying to develop a standardized approach uh, that will improve patient outcome. So this is that case at the end that I told you. So she got X fixed at the end. Uh, we took her a month post op and fixed her pelvis. Um, and then this is her. I got my mentor to send me. This is her two years later, which is pretty amazing considering she had that open tibia and everything else. But that is because you know, like you, Pitt, he had like a very good, like systematic approach to this. Yeah.